Start a recording intro. Chapter 7 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ray Christensen. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dreyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 7 The Stock Ticker. The letters and figures used in the language of the tape, said a well known Boston stock speculator, are very few, but they spell ruin in 99 million ways. It is not to be inferred, however, that the modern stock ticker has anything to do with the making or losing of fortunes. There were regular daily stock market reports in London newspapers in 1825, and New York soon followed the example. As far back as 1692, Houghton issued in London a weekly review of financial and commercial transactions upon which Macaulay based the lively narrative of stock speculation in the 17th century given in his famous history. That which the ubiquitous stock ticker has done is to give instantaneously to the news of what the stock market is doing so that at every minute thousands of miles apart, brokers, investors, and gamblers may learn the exact conditions. The existence of such facilities is to be admired rather than deplored. News is vital to Wall Street, and there is no living man on whom the things in Wall Street are without effect. Financial history of the United States and of the world, as shown by the prices of government bonds and general securities, has been told daily for 40 years on these narrow strips of paper tape, of which thousands of miles are yearly run through the tickers of the New York alone. It is true that the record of the chattering little machine made in cannibalistic abbreviations on the tape can drive a man suddenly to the very verge of insanity with joy or despair. But if there be blame for that, it attaches to the American spirit of speculation and not to the ingenious mechanism which reads and registers the beating of the financial pulse. Edison came first to New York in 1868 with his early stock printer, which he tried unsuccessfully to sell. He went back to Boston and quite undismayed got up a duplex telegraph. Toward the end of my stay in Boston, he says, I obtained a loan of money amounting to $800 to build a particular kind of duplex telegraph for sending two messages over a single wire simultaneously. The apparatus was built and I left the Western Union employ and went to Rochester, New York to test the apparatus on the lines of the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph between that city and New York. But the assistant at the other end could not be made to understand anything. Notwithstanding, I had written out a very minute description of just what to do. After trying for a week, I gave it up and returned to New York with but a few cents in my pocket. Thus, he who has never speculated in a stock in his life was destined to make the beginnings of his own fortune but by providing for others the apparatus that should bring to the eye all over a great city the momentary fluctuations of stocks and bonds. No one could have been in dire poverty than he when the steamboat landed him in New York in 1869. He was in debt, and his few belongings in books and instruments had to be left behind. He was not far from starving. Mr. W. S. Mallory, an associate of many years, quotes directly from him on this point. Some years ago, we had a business negotiation in New York, which made it necessary for Mr. Edison and me to visit the city five or six times within a comparatively short period. It was our custom to leave Orange about 11 a.m. on arrival in New York to get our lunch before keeping the appointments, which were usually made for two o'clock. Several of these lunches were at Domonico's, Sherry's, and other places of similar character. But one day while en route, Mr. Edison said, I have been to lunch with you several times now today I am going to take you to lunch with me and give you the finest lunch you have ever had. When we arrived at Hoboken, we took the downtown ferry across the Hudson, and when we arrived on the Manhattan side, 
Mr. Edison led the way to Smith and McNeil's, opposite Washington Market and well known to old New Yorkers. We went inside and as soon as the waiter appeared, Mr. Edison ordered apple dumplings and a cup of coffee for himself. He consumed his share of the lunch with the greatest possible pleasure. Then as soon as he'd finished, he went to the cigar counter and purchased cigars. As we walked to keep the appointment, he gave me the following reminiscence. When he left Boston and decided to come to New York, he had only money enough for the trip. After leaving the boat, his first thought was of breakfast, but he was without money to obtain it. However, in passing a wholesale tea house, he saw a man tasting tea. So he went in and asked the taster if he might have some of the tea. This the man gave him, and thus he obtained his first breakfast in New York. He knew a telegraph operator here, and on him he depended a loan to tide him over until such time as he should secure a position. During the day, he succeeded in locating this operator, but found that he also was out of a job, and that the best he could do was loan him one dollar, which he did. This small sum of money represented both food and lodging until time as work could be obtained. Edison said that as a result of the time consumed and the exercise in walking while he found his friend, he was extremely hungry and that he gave most serious consideration as to what he should buy in the way of food and what particular kind of food would be most satisfying and filling. The result was that at Smith and McNeil's he decided to, on apple dumplings and a cup of coffee, that which he never ate anything more appetizing. It was not long before he was at work and was able to live in a normal manner. During the Civil War, with its enormous increase in the national debt and the volume of paper money, gold had gone to a high premium and, as ever, by its fluctuations in the price of the value of other commodities it was determined. This led to the creation of a gold room in Wall Street where the precious metal could be dealt in, while for dealings in stock there also extended the regular board and the open board and the long room. Devoted to one but the leading object of speculation, the gold room was the very focus of all the financial and gambling activity of the time, and its quotations governed trade and commerce. At first notations in chalk and on blackboards sufficed. But seeing their inadequacy, Dr. S. S. Laws, Vice President and actual presiding officer of the Gold Exchange, devised and introduced what was popularly known as the Gold Indicator. At first, notations in chalk on the blackboard sufficed. But seeing their inadequacy, Dr. S. S. Laws, Vice President and actual presiding officer of the Gold Exchange, devised and introduced what was popularly known as the Gold Indicator. This exhibited merely the prevailing price of gold, but as its quotations changed from instant to instant, it was in a most literal sense the sonores of the neighboring eyes. One indicator looked upon the gold room, the other opened toward the street. Within the exchange, the face could easily be seen high up on the west wall of the room, and the machine was operated by Mr. Mersoso, the official registrar of the gold board. Dr. Laws, who afterward became president of the State University of Missouri, was an inventor of unusual ability and attainments. In his early youth, he had earned his livelihood in a tool factory, and apparently with his savings, he went to Princeton, where he studied electricity under no less a teacher than the famous Joseph Henry. At the outbreak of the war in 1861, he was president of one of the Presbyterian Synodical Colleges of the South, whose buildings passed into the hands of the government. Going to Europe, he returned to New York in 1863 and became interested with a relative in financial matters. His connection with the gold exchange soon followed when it was organized. The indicating mechanism he devised was electrical, controlled at central by two circuit closed keys, and was a prototype of all the later and modern step-by-step -step printing telegraphs upon which the distribution of financial news depended. The fraction drum of the indicator could be driven in either direction, known as the advantage and retrograde movements, and was divided and marked into eighths. It geared into a unit drum, which as do speed indicators and cyclometers. 
Four electrical pulsations were required to move the drum the distance between the fractions. The general operation was simple, and in normally active times the mechanism and the registrar were equal to all emergencies. But it is obvious that the recorder had to be carried away to the broker's office and other places by messengers, and the delay, confusion, and mistakes soon suggested that Dr. Laws the desirability of having a number of indicators at such scatter points, operated by a master transmitter and dispersing with the regiments of noisy boys. He secured this privilege of distribution and resigning from the exchange, devoted his exclusive attention to the gold reporting telegraph, which he patented, and for which, at the end of 1866, he had scarcely 50 subscribers. His indicators were small oblong boxes in the front of which was a long slot, allowing the dial as they traveled past inside to show the numerals consisting the quotation, the dials or wheels being arranged in a row horizontally overlapping each other as in modern fare registers which are now seen on most trolley cars. It was not long before there were 300 subscribers, but the very success of this device brought competition and improvements. Mr. E. A. Callahan an ingenious printing telegraph operator, saw that there were unexhaustible possibilities in the idea, and his foresight and inventiveness made him the father of the ticker, in connection with which he was thus, like laws, one of the first to grasp and exploit the underlying principle of the central station as a universal source of supply. The genius of this invention, Mr. Callahan was told in an interesting way, in 1867, on the site of the present Mills building on Broadway Street, opposite the stock exchange of today, was an old building which had been cut up to subverse the necessities of its occupants, all engaged in the dealing of gold and stocks. It had one main entrance from the street to a hallway from which entrance to the offices of two prominent broker firms was obtained. Each firm had its own army of boys, numbering from 12 to 15, whose duties were to ascertain the latest quotations from the different exchanges. Each boy devoted his attention to some particularly active stock, pushing each other to get into those narrow quarters, yelling out the prices at the door, and pushing back for later ones. The hustle made this doorway to me a most undesirable refuge from an April shower. I was simply whirled into the street. I naturally thought that much of this noise and confusion might be dispersed, and that the prices might be furnished through some system of telegraphy which would not require the employment of skilled operators. The conception of the stock ticker dates from this incident. Mr. Callahan's first idea was to distribute gold quotations and to this end he devised an indicator. It consisted of two dials mounted separately, each revolved by an electromagnet so that the desired figures were brought to an aperture in the case enclosing the apparatus as in the laws system. Each shaft with its dial was provided with two ratcheted wheels, one the reverse of the other. One was used in connection with the propelling lever, which was provided to a pawl to fit into the teeth of the reversed ratcheted wheel in, on its forward movement. It was thus made impossible for either dial to go by a momentum beyond its limit. Learning that Dr. Laws, with the skillful aid of F. L. Pope, was already active in the same direction, Mr. Callahan, with ready wit, transformed his indicator into a ticker that would make a printed record. The name of the ticker came through the casual remark of a, an observer to whom the noise was the most striking feature of the mechanism. Mr. Callahan removed the two dials and substituting type wheels turned the movements face to face so that each type wheel could imprint its characters upon a paper tape in two lines. Three wires stranded together from the central office to each instrument. Of these, one furnished the current for the alphabet wheel, one for the figure wheel, and one for the mechanism that took care of inking and printing on the tape. Callahan made the further innovation of insulating his circuit wires. Although the cost was then 40 times as great as that of bare wires, it will be understood that electromagnets were the ticker's actuating agency. The ticker apparatus was placed under a neat glass shade and mounted on a shelf. Twenty-five instruments were energized from one circuit, and the quotations were supplied from a central at 18 New Street. 
the Gold and Stott Telegraph Company was promptly organized to supply to brokers the system, which was very rapidly adopted throughout the financial district of New York at the southern tip of Manhattan Island. Quotations were transmitted by Morse Telegraph from the floor of the stock exchange to the central and thence distributed to the subscribers. Success with the stock news system was instantaneous. It was at this juncture that Edison reached New York and, according to his own statement, found shelter at night in the battery room of the Gold Indicator Company, having meantime applied for a position as an operator with the Western Union. He had to wait a few days, and during this time he seized the opportunity to study the indicators and the complicated general transmitter in the office, controlled from the keyboard of the operator on the floor of the Gold Exchange. What happened next? has been the basis of many inaccurate stories, but is dramatic enough as told in Mr. Edison's own version. On the third day of my arrival and while sitting in the office, the complicated general instrument for sending on all the lines and which made a very great noise, suddenly came to a stop with a crash. Within two minutes, over 300 boys, a boy from every broker in the street, rushed upstairs and crowded the long aisle and office that hardly had room for 100, all yelling that such and such a broker's wire was out of order and to fix it at once. It was pandemonium, and the man in charge became so excited that he lost control of all knowledge he ever had. I went to the indicator and, having studied it thoroughly, knew where the trouble ought to be and found it one of the innumerable contact springs had broken off and fallen down between two gear wheels and stopped the instrument, but it was not very noticeable. As I went out to tell the man in charge what the matter was, Dr. Laws appeared on the scene, the most excited person I had seen. He demanded of the man the cause of the trouble, but the man was speechless. I ventured to say that I knew what the problem was, and he said, fix it, fix it, be quick. I removed the spring and set the contact wheels at zero, and the line, battery, and inspecting men all scattered through the financial district to set the instruments. In about two hours, things were working again. Dr. Laws came in to ask my name and what I was doing. I told him, and he asked me to come to his private office the following day. His office was filled with stacks of books, all relating to metaphysics and kindred matters. He asked me a great many questions about the instruments and his system, and I showed him how he could simplify things generally. He then requested that I should call next day. On arrival, he stated at once that he had decided to put me in charge of the whole plant and that my salary would be $300 per month. This was such a violent jump from anything I had ever seen before that it rather paralyzed me for a while. I thought it was too much to be lasting but I determined to try and live up to the salary. If 20 hours a day of hard work would do it, I kept this position, made many improvements, devised several stock tickers until the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company consolidated with the Gold Indicator Company. Certainly few changes in fortune have ever been more sudden and dramatic in any notable career than this which thus placed an ill-clad unkempt, half-starved, eager lad in a position of such responsibility in days when the fluctuations of the price of gold at every instant meant fortune or ruin to thousands. Edison, barely 21 years old, was a keen observer of the stirring events around him. Wall Street is at any time an interesting study, but it was never at a more agitated and sensational period of its history than at this time. Edison's arrival in New York coincided with an act of speculation in gold which may, indeed, be said to have provided him with an occupation, and was soon followed by the attempt of Mr. J. Gould and his associates to corner the gold market, precipitating the panic of Black Friday, September 24, 1869. Securing its important duties in the precious metals, and thus assisting to create an artificial stringency in the gold market, the government had made it a practice to revive the situation by selling a million of gold each month. The metal was thus restored into circulation. In some manner, President Grant was persuaded that general conditions and the movement of the crops would be helped if the sale of gold were suspended for a time, and this put into effect. He went to visit an old friend in the Pennsylvania remote from railroads and telegraphs.
The gold pool had acquired control of $10 million in gold and drove the price upward rapidly from 144 toward their goal of 200. On Black Friday, they purchased another $28 million at 160, and still the price went up. The financial and commercial interests of the country were in panic, but the pool persevered in its effort to corner gold, with a profit of many millions contingent on success, yielding a frantic request. President Grant, who returned to Washington, caused Secretary Baldwell of the Treasury to throw $4 million of gold into the market. Relief was instantaneous. The corner was broken, but the harm had been done. Edison's remarks shed a vivid sidelight on this extraordinary episode. On Black Friday, he says, we had a very exciting time with the indicators. The Gould and Fisk crowd had cornered gold and had run the quotations up faster than the indicator could follow. The indicator was composed of several wheels. On the circumference of each wheel were the numerals, and one wheel had fractions. It worked in the same way as an ordinary counter. One wheel made ten revolutions, and at the tenth it advanced the adjacent wheel, and this, in its turn, having gone ten revolutions, advanced the next wheel, and so on. On the morning of Black Friday, the indicator was quoting 150 premium, whereas the bids by Gould's agents in the gold room were 165 for five millions or any part. We had a paperweight at the transmitter to speed it up, and by one o'clock reached the right quotation. The excitement was prodigious. New York, as well as Broad Street, was jammed with excited people. I sat on top of the Western Union Telegraph booth to watch the surging crazy crowd. One man came to the booth, grabbed a pencil, and attempted to write a message to Boston. The first stroke went clear off the blank. He was so excited that he had the operator write the message for him. Amid great excitement, Spire, the banker, went crazy and it took five men to hold him, and everybody lost their head. The Western Union operator came to me and said, Shake, Edison, we are okay. We've got a cent. I felt very happy because we were poor. These occasions are very enjoyable to a poor man, but they rarely occur. There is a calm sense of detachment about this description that has been possessed by the narrator even in the most anxious moments of his career. He was determined to see all that could be seen and, quitting his perch on the telegraph booth, sought the more secluded headquarters of the pool forces. A friend of mine was an operator who worked in the office of Belden and Company, 60 Broadway, which were headquarters for Fisk. Mr. Gould was uptown in the Erie office in the Grand Opera House. The firm on Broad Street, Smith and Gould and Martin, was the other branch. All were connected with wires. Gould seemed to be in charge, Fisk being the executive downtown. Fisk wore a velvet corduroy coat and a very peculiar vest. He was very chipper and seemed to be light-hearted and happy. Sitting around the room were about a dozen fine-looking men. All had the complexion of cadavers. There was a basket of champagne. Hundreds of boys were rushing and paying checks, all checks being payable to Belden and Company. When James Brown of Brown Brothers and Company broke the corner by selling five million gold, all payments were repudiated by Smith, Gould, and Martin, but they continued to receive checks at Belden and Companies for some time until the street got wind of the game. There was some kind of conspiracy with the government people, which I could not make out, but I heard messages that opened my eyes as to the ramifications of Wall Street. Gold fell to 132 and it took us all night to get the indicator back to that quotation. All night long the streets were full of people. Every broker's office was brilliantly lighted all night and all hands were at work. The clearing house for gold had been swamped and all was mixed up. No one knew if he was bankrupt or not. Edison in those days rather liked the modest coffee shops and mentions visiting one. When on the New York number one wire that I worked in Boston, there was an operator named Jerry Brost at the other end. He was a first-class receiver and rapid sender. We made up a scheme to hold this wire, so he changed one letter of the alphabet, and as soon as I got used to it, and finally we changed three letters. If any operator tried to receive from Brost, he couldn't do it, so Brost and I always worked together. Brost did less talking than any operator I ever knew. Never having seen him, I went while in New York to call upon him. I did all the talking. He would listen, 
stroke his beard, and say nothing. In the evening I went over to an all-night lunch house in the printing house square in a basement, Oliver's. Night editors included Horace Greeley and Henry Raymond of the New York Times took their midnight lunch there. When I went with Brost and the other operator, they pointed out two or three men who were then celebrated in the newspaper world. The night was intensely hot and close. After getting our lunch and upon reaching the sidewalk, Brost opened his mouth and said, that's a great place, a plate of cakes, a cup of coffee, and a Russian bath for 10 cents. This was about 50% of his conversation for two days. The work of Edison on the Gold Indicator had thrown him into close relationships with Mr. Franklin L. Pope, the young telegraph engineer then associated with Dr. Laws, and afterward a distinguished expert and technical writer who became president of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers in 1886. Each recognized the special ability of the other, and barely a week after the famous events of Black Friday, the announcement of their partnership appeared in the Telegrapher of October 1, 1869. This was the first professional card, if it may be so described, ever issued in America by a form of electrical engineers, and is here reproduced. It is probable that the advertisement, one of the largest in the Telegrapher, and appearing frequently, was not paid for at full rates, as the publisher, Mr. J. N. Ashley, became a partner in the firm and not altogether a sleeping one when it came to the division of profits, which at times were considerable. In order to be near his new friend, Edison boarded the Pope at Elizabeth, New Jersey for some time, living the strenuous life and the performance of his duties. Associated with Pope and Ashley, he followed up his work on telegraph printers with marked success. While with them, I devised a printer to print gold quotations instead of indicating them, the lines were started and the whole was sold out to the Gould and Stock Telegraph Company. My experimenting was all done in that small shop of Dr. Bradley, located near the station of the Pennsylvania Railroad in New Jersey City. Every night I left for Elizabeth on the 1 a.m. train, then walked half a mile to Mr. Pope's house and up at 6 a.m. for breakfast to catch the 7 a.m. train. This continued for all winter and many were the occasions when I was nearly frozen in the Elizabeth Walk. This Dr. Bradley appears to have been the first in this country to make electrical measurements of precision with a galvanometer, but was an old school experimenter who had worked for years on an experiment without commercial value. He was also extremely irascible, and when on one occasion the connecting wire would not come out of one of the binding posts of a new and costly galvanometer, he jerked the instrument to the floor and then jumped on it. He must have been, however, a man of originality, as evidenced by his attempt to age whiskey by electricity, an attempt that has often been made. The hobby he had at the time I was there, says Edison, was the aging of raw whiskey by passing strong electric currents through it. He had arranged 20 jars with platinum electrodes held in place by hard rubber. When all was ready, he filled the cells with whiskey, connected the battery, locked the door of the small room to which he had placed, and gave positive orders that no one should enter. He then disappeared for three days. On the second day, we noticed a terrible smell in the shop, as if from some dead animal. The next day, the doctor arrived, and noticing the smell, asked what was dead. We all thought something had gotten into his whiskey room and died. He opened it and was nearly overcome. The hard rubber he used was, of course, full of sulfur, and this being attacked by a nauseous hydrogen had produced sulfide hydrogen gas in torrents, displacing all the air in the room. Sulfuride hydrogen is, as is well known, the gas given off by rotten eggs. Another glimpse of this period of development is afforded by an interesting article on the Stock Reporting Telegraph in the Electrical World of March 4, 1899, by Mr. Ralph W. Pope the well-known secretary of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, who had, as a youth, an active and intimate connection with that branch of the electrical industry. In the course of his article, he mentions the curious fact that Dr. Laws, at first, in receiving quotations from the exchanges, was so distrustful of the Morse system that he installed long lines of speaking tubes as a more satisfactory and safe device than the telegraph wires. As to the relations of that time, Mr. Pope remarks, 
The rivalry between the two concerns resulted in consolidation, Dr. Law's enterprise being absorbed by the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, while the Law stock printer was relegated to the scrap heap and the museum competition in the field did not, however, cease. Messrs. Pope and Edison invented a one-wire printer and started a system of gold printers devoted to the recording of gold quotations and sterling exchange only. It was intended more specifically for importers and exchange brokers and was furnished at a lower price than the indicator service. The building and equipment of private telegraph lines was also entered upon. This business was subsequently absorbed by the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, which was probably at this time at the height of its prosperity. The financial organization of the company was peculiar and worthy of attention. Each subscriber for a machine paid in $100 for the privilege of securing an instrument. For the service, he paid $25 weekly. In case he retired or failed, he could transfer his right and employees were constantly on the alert for purchasable rights, which could be disposed of at a profit. It was occasionally worth the profit to convince a man that he did not actually own the machine which had been placed in his office. The Western Union Telegraph Company secured a majority of its stock and General Marshall Lefferts was elected president. A private line department was established and the business taken over from Pope, Edison, and Ashley was rapidly enlarged. At this juncture, General Lefferts, as president of the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, requested Edison to go to work on improving the stock ticker. Furnishing the money and the well-known universal ticker in widespread use in this day was one result. Mr. Edison gives a graphic picture of the startling efforts of his fortunes. I made a great many inventions. One was the special ticker used for many years outside of New York in other large cities. This was made exceedingly simple, as they did not have the experts we had in New York to handle anything complicated. The same ticker was used on the London Stock Exchange. After I had made a great number of inventions and obtained patents, the general seemed anxious that the matter should be closed up. One day I exhibited and worked on a successful device whereby if a ticker should get out of unison in a broker's office and commence to print wild figures, it could be brought in unison from the central station, which saved the labor of many men and much trouble to the broker. He called me into his office and said, now, young man, I want to close up the matter of your inventions. How much do you think you should receive? I had made up my mind that, taking into consideration the time and the killing pace I was working at, I should be entitled to $5,000, but could get along with 3000 When the psychological moment arrived, I hadn't the nerve to name such a large sum. So I said, well, General, suppose you make me offer. Then he said, how would $40,000 strike you? This caused me to come as near fainting as I had ever got. I was afraid he would hear my heart beat. I managed to say that I thought it was fair. All right, I will have a contract drawn. Come around in three days and sign it, and I will give you the money. I arrived on time, but had been doing some considerable thinking on the subject. The sum seemed to be very large for the amount of work, for at that time I determined the value by the time and trouble and not by what the invention was worth to others. I thought there was something unreal about it. However, the contract was handed to me. I signed without reading it. Edison was then handed the first check he'd ever received, one for $40,000 drawn on the Bank of New York at the corner of William and Wall Street. On going to the bank and passing in the check of the paying teller, some brief remarks were made to him, which in his deafness he did not understand. The check was handed back to him, and Edison, fancying for a moment that in some way he had been cheated, went outside to the large steps to let the cold sweat evaporate. He then went back to the general, who with his secretary had a good laugh over the matter, told him the check must be endorsed, and sent him with a young man to identify him. The ceremony of identification performed with the paying teller, who was quite merry over the incident. Edison was given the amount in bundles of small bills until there certainly seemed to be a one cubit foot. Unaware that he was the victim of a practical joke, Edison proceeded gravely to stow away the money in his overcoat pockets and all his other pockets. 
He then went to Newark and sat up all night with the money for fear it might be stolen. Once more he sought help next morning, when the general laughed heartily and telling the clerk that the joke must be not carried any further, and enabled him to deposit the currency in the bank and open an account. Thus, in an inconceivably brief time, had Edison passed from poverty to independence, made a deep impression as to his originality and ability on important people, and brought out valuable inventions, lifting himself at one bound out of the ruck of mediocrity and away from the deadening drudgery of a key. Best of all, he was enterprising, one of the leaders and pioneers for whom the world is always looking and to use his own criticism of himself, he had too sanguine a temperament to keep money in solitary confinement. Quiet self-possession, he seized his opportunity, began to buy machinery, rented a shop, and got to work. Moving quickly into a larger shop, numbers 10 and 12 Ward Street, Newark, New Jersey, he secured large orders from General Lefferitz to build stock tickers and employed 50 men as business increased, he put on a night force and was his own foreman on both shifts. Half an hour of sleep three or four times in the 24 hours was all he needed in those days. When one invention succeeded, another with dazzling rapidity, and when he worked with the new fierce eruptive energy of a great volcano, throwing out new ideas incessantly with spectacular effect on the arts to which they related. It has always been a theory with Edison that we need sleep altogether too much, but on the other hand he never, until long past fifty, knew or practiced the slightest moderation in his work or in the use of strong coffee and black cigars. He has, moreover, while of tender and kindly disposition, never hesitated to use men up as freely as a Napoleon or Grant, seeing only the goal of a complete invention or perfect device to attain which all else must become subsidiary. He gives a graphic picture of his first methods as a manufacturer. Nearly all of my men were on piecework, and I allowed them to make good wages and never cut until the pay became absurdly high as they got more expert. I kept no books. I had two hooks. All the bills and accounts I owned I jabbed on one hook, and the memorandum of all who owed me I put on the other. When some of the bills fell due and I couldn't deliver tickets to get a supply of money, I gave a note. When the notes were due, a messenger came around from the bank with the note and a protest pinned to it for $1.25. Then I would go to New York and get an advance or pay the note if I had the money. This method of giving notes for my accounts and having all notes protested I kept up for over two years, yet my credit was fine. Every store I traded with was always glad to furnish goods perhaps in amazed admiration of my system of doing business, which was certainly new. After a while, Edison got a bookkeeper whose vagrancies made him look back with regret on the earlier primitive method. The first three months I had him go over all the books to find out how much we made. He reported $3,000. I gave a supper to some of my men to celebrate this, only to be told two days afterward that he made a mistake and we had lost $500. And then a few days after that, he came to me again and said he was all mixed up, and now he found we'd made over $7,000. Edison changed bookkeepers, but never thereafter counted anything real profit until he had paid all his debts and had the profits in the bank. The factory work at this time related chiefly to stock tickers, principally the Universal, of which at one time 1,200 were in use. Edison's connections with this particular device was very close while it lasted. In a review of the ticker art, Mr. Callahan stated, with rather grudging praise, that a ticker at the present time, 1901, would be considered as impractical and unsaleable if it were not provided with a unison device. And he goes on to remark, the first unison on stock tickers was one used on the Law's printer, footnote two. It was a crude and unsatisfactory piece of mechanism and necessitated doubling of the battery in order to bring it into action. It was short-lived. The Edison unison compromised a lever with a free end traveling on a spiral or worm on the type wheel shaft until it met a pin at the end of the worm, thus obstructing the shaft and leaving the type wheels at the zero point until released by the printing lever. 
This device is too well known to require a further description. It is not applicable to any instrument using two independently moving type wheels, but on nearly, if not all, other instruments will be found in use. The stock ticker has enjoyed the devotion of many brilliant inventors, G.M. Phelps, H. Van Hovenberg, A.A. A. Knudsen, G.B. Scott, S.D. Field, John Burry, and remains in extensive use as an application for which no substitute or competitor has been found. In New York, the two great stock exchanges have deemed it necessary to own and operate a stock ticker service for the sole benefit of their members, and down to the present moment the process of improvement has gone on, impelled by the increasing volume of business to be reported. It is significant of Edison's work, now dimmed and overlaid by later advances, that at the very outset he recognized the vital importance of the interchangeability in the construction of this delicate and sensitive apparatus. But the difficulties of these early days were almost insurmountable. Mr. R. W. Pope says of the universal machines that they were simple and substantial and generally satisfactory, but adds, these instruments were supposed to have been made with interchangeable parts, but as a matter of fact, the instances in which these parts would fit were very few. The instruction book prepared for the use of the inspector states that the parts should not be tinkered or bent as they are accurately made and interchangeable. The difficulties encountered in fitting them properly doubtless gave rise to a story that Mr. Edison had stated there were three degrees of interchangeability. This was interpreted to mean, first, the parts will fit, second, they will almost fit, third, they do not fit and can't be made to fit. Footnote 2. This I invented as well. T-A-E. This early shop affords an illustration of the manner in which Edison has made a deep impression on the personnel of the electrical arts. At a single bench, there work three men since rich or prominent. One was Sigmund Bergman, for a time partner with Edison in his lighting developments in the United States, and now head and principal owner of the electrical works in Berlin, employing 10,000 men. The next man adjacent was John Crusey, afterward engineer of the great General Electric Works at Schenectady. A third was Schuckert, who left the bench to settle up with his father's little estate in Nuremberg, stayed there and founded electrical factories, which became the third largest in Germany, their proprietor dying very wealthy. I gave them good training as to working hours and hustling, says their quadrum master, and this is equally true as applies to many scores of others working in companies bearing Edison's name or organized under Edison patents. It is curiously sufficient in this connection that of the 21 presidents of the National Society, the American Institute of the Electrical Engineers, founded in 1884, eight have been intimately associated with Edison, namely Norvin Green and F. L. Polk, as business colleagues of the days of which we now write, while Messrs. Frank J. Sprague, T. C. Martin, A. E. Kenley, S. S. Wheeler, John W. Lieb, Jr., and Lewis Ferguson have all been at one time or another in Edison employ. The remark was once made that if a famous American teacher sat at one end of a log and a student at the other end, the elements of a successful university were present. It is equally true that in Edison and the many men who have graduated from his stern school of endeavor, America has had its foremost seat of electrical engineering. End of chapter 7. End of Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dreyer and Thomas Cromford Martin.